happy sunny spring Friday to everyone. I have some more shorebirds for you. These are a flock of brant geese. Uh, I think they look uh, fairly fancy, like they're wearing a, a suit of some kind. Oh, yeah, I think Peyton grabbed you. Oh, also have uh, some black turnstones, a kind of round, uh, plump shorebird, and uh, the uh, very similar ruddy turnstone. See that there is a difference in, in coloration between the two. And I've shown it to you before, but it's just so goofy I have to show it again. The rhinoceros auklet uh, with its elaborate eyebrow and horn. Uh, thank you. Uh, Evolution for this creature. All right. So, what questions do you have about uh, the memory allocation stuff, uh, buffer overflow stuff for the lab, uh, anything else that we've been doing? Sue. I think this might be a silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, in the lab, we're like putting code onto the stack. How is that code running? <laughs> Uh, you mean, how is it allowed to run on the stack, or? Is it running on the stack? Is that where it's running? So, when we run an instruction, it's coming from somewhere in memory. It's being loaded into the CPU and then executed on the CPU. So, when you put code on the stack, and then you say, Overwrite the return address with the address of that code. Oh, well, that address has to be on the stack too. Yes, so you overwrite the return address with the address of the code that you put on the stack. So then when the return happens, it jumps and starts executing that code where it's now it's just loading it from code from a different point in memory, in this case on the stack, into the CPU. Uh, this works because for the C target program, the stack uh, is not protected by making it, it's your, it's executable. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? All right, so we're going to continue our look at uh, allocation today. Uh, and I'd like to do, we're going to kind of start digging into some more of the actual mechanics of how does an allocator, uh, like how do we actually implement an allocator? How does it keep track of the information it needs to keep track of? Uh, and before we get into that, I want to lay out some high level kind of requirements and goals that when we want to design something like Malik that is going to be managing memory, what do we actually need it to do? And what are the factors that might go into what's a good design versus a less good design? So we'll start with the requirements. What does this Alec, what, what does Malik or something like it have to do? First, to be able to handle arbitrary sequences of requests, which just means our allocator is not going to be able to assume, for example, that all calls to malloc happen before all calls to free, uh, or you know, make any other assum simplifying assumptions about the sequence of requests. They could just be any sequence, and the allocator should be able to handle them appropriately. The second requirement is that our allocator is going to have to respond to requests immediately. And by immediately, I don't mean that it like executes instantly somehow. I just mean that it can't delay responding to a request to try and get information about future requests before it makes a decision about the current one. So when a program calls malloc, malloc has got to meet that request in return. 
I can't kind of wait or delay, even if that might let the allocator be more efficient. Another requirement, or at least a requirement that we'd want to meet as much as possible, is that our allocator use only the heap to keep track of data. So the main concern here is that there might be various data about the structure of the heap that the allocator wants to keep track of. And we're saying, no, you can't just make this all global variables, stick this all in some other part of memory than the heap. The allocator should just use memory on the heap to uh, perform its tasks. It shouldn't be kind of, uh, barring memory from, from other, other parts of the program. We're going to require that our allocator align blocks. And this just means in practice, this alignment is about the addresses that we return to the user. Why, when I say align blocks, Am I emphasizing that it's about what we return to the user? So, is there a difference between the hardware addresses and the addresses of the user and the program manipulates? There absolutely is a difference there. Um, that is not actually what I'm getting at here, just because like both the malloc function and the user program, they'll be using the same addresses, uh, which as we'll see, uh, next week are virtual addresses rather than physical. So there is a difference, uh, but it doesn't sort of sit in between malloc and, and the user. Other thoughts on, on why it's about the address we give to the user? Why? Because the user needs to be able to navigate Yeah, it's the, the user is the one who's going to use these addresses to store data, and the user is going to want that data to be aligned. And it would not be helpful if, say, the block was nicely aligned, but then the address that we gave back to the user maybe is referring to some part of that block that is not aligned. And we'll see an example of sort of this distinction but when we talk about alignment, it's really we need to give addresses back to the user that are aligned so that when the user puts data onto the heap, that data is aligned. Our final requirement is that our allocator is not going to be allowed to modify allocated blocks. Why is that important? What might happen if malloc returns a pointer to you and then malloc was allowed to modify that memory? Exactly. If malloc is allowed to do stuff with allocated blocks, and the reason it might want to is it says, oh, it would be more efficient if this allocated block were to move over here. Or uh, it would be more efficient if I switched, like program A is using this one, program B is using this one, what if I switched them? That's going to be better for uh, the structure of the heap. That's just going to break whatever program is using that heap memory if stuff is kind of moving around uh, underneath it. So once a block is allocated, the allocator is just stuck with that block where it is until it is free. Other questions on these requirements? 
Yes, sir. Is that about the aligned blocks and the aligned addresses? So you're saying that the block is aligned, the address is aligned? Uh, I'm saying from these are uh, these requirements are sort of from the perspective of someone calling them. Uh, and so, from the perspective of someone calling malloc, um, it's important that the address malloc returns to me is aligned, because then I don't have to worry that data I store in that memory on the heap won't be aligned, because it kind of begins at an address that is that is aligned. Um, and uh, We'll see in, in some examples how what this means is when we say, okay, the heap is 16 byte aligned, that's going to mean that the addresses we return to the user need to be multiples of 16, rather than the start of each kind of block that the heap is keeping track of is a multiple of 16, because as we'll see, because any extra information that we need to keep track of has to be on the heap, the blocks on the heap are going to include both the user's data and also some extra information that the allocator needs to keep track of. And it's the user's data that we care about being aligned, not the heap's extra information. Other questions? All right, these are our requirements. We also have a few goals. Uh, and it's really just two. Goal number one. is maximize throughput. And throughput is uh, a term that means something like the operations per second. So we just want to maximize, say, the number of calls to malloc that can happen in one second. Just want it to be really fast. Second goal is to maximize memory utilization. And to illustrate why this is important, let's consider uh, a really simple allocator. Here's our heap, and our allocator says, all right, when a request comes in, I'm just going to allocate the next chunk uh, on the heap. And when someone calls free, it's going to do nothing. Because doing nothing is extremely fast and also simple. And so, you know, my heap starts off with a chunk of 4,000. 96 bytes, and a request comes in, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's for 32 bytes, and the allocator just says, well, allocate the next chunk. That hand a pointer back to these 4,000 bytes. There's enough there to meet this request, so that's fine. Uh, another request comes in, well, we'll just add another chunk of 4,096 bytes to the heap, allocate that, return a pointer to that, and we just do this for every request and we never free any memory. How would this allocator rate on our throughput versus utilization, where utilization is how much of the space on the heap is the user actually 
making use of? How, like, what percentage of our total heap space are we actually using for data, and how much is sort of just sitting around? Throughput would be extremely good. There's almost nothing that a call to Malik or free needs to do. So it will happen extremely quick. So great on throughput. How about memory utilization? Kind of more because we're wasting a lot. Yes, absolutely true. It's about the worst that you could possibly do on the memory utilization front. And so that's why we have both of these goals, because there is often a trade-off where these two are involved. Meaning that if we make malloc and free like very complicated to try and manage our heap very precisely, get our like have perfect no wasted space, utilization is going to be better, but all that extra work is going to make these functions slower and lower our throughput. And so when we're designing an allocator, these two goals are often in tension when we're having to make decisions under trade-offs. Does that make sense? All right, so. lay out some implementation issues, things that we have to decide how our allocator will do them. Our allocator implementation will need to have some way of keeping track of free blocks on the heap. Like our very simple allocator, it could just keep track of maybe a single pointer, a single address of like the next three block. And that's all that it would keep track of because it never frees anything, so there's at most one free block on it. But if we're doing something more sophisticated, we'll have need some way of keeping track of potentially a large number of free blocks and where they are. Our allocator will need to have some way of deciding, given some request for 32 bytes, 96 bytes, one byte, whatever it is, where to act, what free block to actually use to satisfy that request. And that's called placement. We talked about some of that last time with, do we look for the best fit, the thing that exactly fits our request, or do we just look for the first fit, the first free block that we can find, that satisfies the request, even if it's not precisely the right size. When we do find a block, the allocator is going to have to determine, as we saw here, maybe we had malloc like 32, and we had this block of 4,096 bytes. And this allocator said, I'm, never, I'm not going to split blocks. I'm going to find a block that is big enough and then allocate that entire block. But you could imagine that a different allocator could have split off the 32 bytes for this request and then left the rest of this as now a smaller free block on the And our last implementation issue here is coalescing. Which is about combining free blocks. Which is to say in the situation where we did split off this 32 and we were left with 4064. 
If then later, this 32 is free, we call free on the point that we just returned here. Now we have a free block, free block of 32, a free block of 4064. Coalescing is when and how do we combine these? Because we could have one larger free block of 4096 instead of these two. Does that make sense? All right, questions on these implementation issues? Yeah? Um, can you quickly, like, over, like, you think I could have this class? Uh, the key idea here is what do we do when the free block that we find is larger than the amount of memory that's being requested? Uh, do we split it into two? How do we do that? Are there any circumstances where we wouldn't split it? Uh, decisions on uh, what should happen in that case. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right. So last time I talked about two kinds of fragmentation that might arise. Uh, on the heap. Anyone remember what those types of fragmentation were? What? Internal fragmentation and external fragmentation? Yeah, give, uh, give any of the definition for one of those. So the internal fragmentation is like unused bits of memory inside of a block, and then external fragmentation is entire blocks that are. Yeah, internal fragmentation is we have some kind of extra or unused space that's inside uh, of a block. Uh, external fragmentation, there was like a particular scenario where that came up last time. Does anyone remember what that was? Uh, it's when we can get like the memory in the block and we yeah, it's when we couldn't satisfy a request, but like if the heap was just had no free space, then we also couldn't satisfy a request, but that wouldn't really be external fragmentation. So what was it about the heap when we couldn't satisfy a request that made it like external fragmentation? Peter? Uh, so there is enough space in the heap that they are all fragmented into several pieces, so they cannot be like now completely free space. Exactly. So we have enough total free space, but there are, the free space is split up such that all of the pieces are too small to satisfy the request. Um, does that make sense? Um, so like on that on that note re regarding coalescing, can you make coalesce like contiguous blocks? Yes, that's that's a good point. That any time that we're so if a, a user asks for a thousand bytes on the heap, we can't give them four separate chunks of memory that are each two hundred and fifty bytes because we only return one pointer, and the user has to assume that all 1,000 bytes start at that pointer. Uh, so we're not, for that reason, it would only cause problems if we somehow combined blocks that were not adjacent. Uh, all right, so with that in mind, let's do a little bit of practice. Right. So 
just to make sure that we're all feeling good about what external fragmentation is, uh, I'd like to think about which of these four things is not the source of internal fragmentation. Mostly thinking C, but some uh, choosing other answers. Please discuss with your neighbor why you chose the answer you did. All right. Big consensus on C. That's excellent. That will not be where internal fragmentation comes from. Uh, so let's talk about each of these four. Um, why, why would placement policy be a source of internal fragmentation? Well, I, guess, I think um, this means that if you choose the first available block, it will result in like choosing a bad block that requires, I guess this relates to the second answer too, requires padding. Uh, so we may introduce padding to keep things aligned, uh, but that is separate, that's sort of a separate source from our, uh, our placement policy, Lysander. Well, like if you, um, if you ask for like a block that can hold like eight characters, then you've got one for like 10 characters, you have space for, for two more, and then they just go on the loop. Yeah. If uh, or in our, our simple allocator, you asked for 32, I gave you 4,096. It's a lot of uh, internal fragmentation, kind of space that's not useful part of the heap, but is not actually being used. Uh, pattern of future requests. Why, like, how does that relate to fragmentation? Any ideas? It's not internal. Why? I mean, uh, the pattern of future requests is going to affect um, the distribution of memory as to what is freed and what is taken up. And that could certainly like lead to everything external fragmentation. Exactly. This but, yeah, within, within things that are allocated in your entire unit. That that is one request in of itself. Yeah, this pattern of future requests is that is how we define external fragmentation. We said external fragmentation was when there was a request that we couldn't meet, even though we had enough total free space on the heap to meet it. And so whether we have external fragmentation or not, in some sense, depends on the pattern of future requests. Like it could happen that we don't ever get a request that we can't fill because the heap is too fragmented. But maybe we do. Uh, but as Pi said, not affecting kind of the internal fragmentation to a particular with a particular block. PJ. Oh, what does the memory use to maintain heap data structures? Yes, this memory used to maintain heap data structures. Uh, the reason it would be internal fragmentation is that if we have stuff that's part of a block, but that isn't the part that a user can actually read and write data from. That's internal fragmentation. It's part of a block that's not actually useful uh, for the person who called mal. What is this memory? That will be the focus for the rest of today's lecture. Like what are these data structures? What is this data that they're keeping track of? Kevin. Oh, I just have a quick question about internal fragmentation itself. So is internal fragmentation like this, 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 this idea that there are just certain parts of a block that a user can't use, or is the idea that like, um, let, let, let's say you have a block 10, 10 bytes long, right? And then the sixth byte is not accessible. Does that mean that you have nine bytes that you could use, or does that mean that you only have six in the first bit? Uh, so for that particular example, bytes that are internal fragmentation, it won't make sense for them to appear in the middle of a block. Because the user 
will see a block with a contiguous chunk of memory. So if there's something that they aren't supposed to overwrite that's in the middle, well, that effectively prevents them from being able to, to, to use the rest of it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the general idea. We have some total block size and then some maybe smaller portion of it that is the payload or the part of the block that is uh, what we're giving to the user to store data on the heap. And the rest of that space, whether it's extra space because the block's bigger than what they asked for, whether it's extra space we added to their request in order to align it to a multiple of 16, or whether it's actually this data that the allocator itself is using to maintain its data structures. Those are all kind of stuff that are part of blocks that's not actually part of the, the useful part from the, the user's perspective. Well, uh, so we know what the difference between internal fragmentation and then adding typing. Uh, do you mean why padding is internal fragmentation or? Oh, so padding is an example. Yes. Okay. okay. Padding is one of the sources of internal fragmentation. I think. Um, so when you defined um, external versus internal uh, fragmentation earlier in the term, like we used like diagrams of like external was like the like end on like the outsides. Oh, um, so I mean, I'm a little confused about the definition of it. Is it like ones on the outside, or is it like when you your data is too broken up around the like throughout the heap and so you can't allocate? Yeah. So we we define internal external fragmentation with respect to uh, how a struct was laid out in memory. And now we also have these same terms, terms, internal and external fragmentation as it relates to the heap. These are separate ideas. Um, they are related in the sense that internal for structs was inside between the struct fields, internal here is inside blocks, external is something kind of added to the end of the struct, whereas external here is about the space between blocks. So there's some overlap there, but they are distinct ideas. Other questions? Oh. I guess, um, just, I think I would be aware of this, but if we run out of space, like in Kubi, you know, like the heap and the stack are already put together, would that come as an external fragmentation? Or is it that something that? Yes, yeah, so what if we run out of memory? Um, so the particular case that you mentioned where the stack and the heap grow to actually meet each other. Uh, at least when we're talking about uh, a 64-bit system, the distance between this, like if the stack is at these very high addresses and the heap is, is at the middle, and for, in order for them to actually hit each other, the program would have to be using far more memory than the system actually has. So you know, at that point, if a program gets to that point, it, we probably already needed to terminate it because it was crashing the system. Um, what happens when the heap is out of memory is an important question. And just like we have a dedicated register, the stack pointer, to keep track of where the boundary of the stack is, system keeps track of called break or BRK, because computer scientists hate vowels, uh, that is just the memory address that is the top boundary of the heap. And so it's like the stack pointer, but it doesn't get its own special register, it's just a variable in, in memory that the operating system keeps track of. And that there's
And there is a function provided by the operating system called sbreak that a program can use to move the breakpoint and change this boundary of the heap. And in practice, malloc, when the allocator, when malloc can't can find uh, a free block to meet some request on a heap, it will call sbreak in order to add more space to the heap that then it can use uh, to satisfy that request. So in my earlier example where we just kept adding chunks of 4096 to the heap to meet each request, that was malloc just calling sbreak each time to keep growing the heap bigger and bigger as it needed. Yeah. I'm guessing now, like, when would we get an external fragmentation if we can just always give it more and more space? Uh, so internal fragmentation is the situation where the current heap has enough total free space, but it's too broken up to meet that request. So in the presence of internal fragmentation, we might need to call sbreak to add more space to the heap even though the heap actually has enough total unused space to meet that request, it's just too fragmented. Okay. So, the not directly connected to what we're talking about right now, but when we're talking about blocks, is that something defined by the hardware, or do blocks vary? Uh, blocks are variable in size, and they're, in this case, they are uh, defined by the allocator. So malloc is keeping track of these blocks, and it is what is dividing the heap up into blocks and, and uh, managing them. All right, so before we go any further, I need to tell you about the first automobiles uh, in US history. So this is not the first US automobile, this is the first kind of uh, 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 the first uh, patented car, if you if you will, the the Benz Motorwagen, um, uh, designed in, in Germany. Um, the first U.S. gasoline-powered car uh, was the uh, Dorea Motorwagen, shown. These are the Dorea brothers from Massachusetts who designed and road tested it. Uh, this was in uh, the late 1800s, uh, and in the early 20th century, you had the first uh, U.S. kind of assembly line factory uh, for cars, uh, the, the Oldsmobile factory. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Mr. Olds. And then uh, Henry Ford uh, took in 1913, sort of took this idea of an assembly line uh, and greatly expanded it to be rather than a and one of the big innovations was that the assembly line would actually like move the vehicle along. And so the kind of car would move to the different workers who were standing still. Uh, and this made it far more efficient. Um, and this is the, the Model T, uh, the car that was designed there. Although the, these initial Model T factories were so efficient that uh, the bottleneck became paint. The paint was just like, they, the paint didn't dry fast enough, uh, unless it was black. And this is why all the original Model T's had to be black, because they just couldn't, the, the other colors of paint until later, uh, a couple of decades, a decade or so later, they just didn't have paint that could dry fast enough to work on these assembly lines. So there's a probably apocryphal quote uh, from Henry Ford that says, uh, people can have a Model T in any color they want as long as it's black. <laughs> All right, so that's that's our our first cars. So now I want to talk about the first of our uh, heap data structures that we'll look at. the implicit free list. And in a nutshell, uh, 
We're going to turn the entire heap into a, quote, linked list of blocks. And I'm putting this in quotes because we're not actually going to have like next pointers or previous pointers. The way that we think of a linked list is going to be implicit in other information that we store. So here's how this is going to work. Our heat block is we're going to have part of it be the payload. This is the user said malloc of 30 bytes. The payload is those at least 30 bytes that the user is actually going to uh, do stuff with. And Up here above the payload, we have the header. Each block is going to have a header. And let's, the header is going to keep track of the information that we need to know about each block. Uh, down here, is if we needed to add padding for alignment purposes, it would come after the payload. Uh, but for this header, let's think about what might we need to keep track of about each block on the heap. Now remember all that we, let's assume we have a pointer to the block, but nothing else. So we know where it is. What else might we need to know about blocks on the heap? Yes, we need to know size. Anything else? DJ? The next block. We're going to need to know uh, the next block in the heap. Turns out that is going to come from the size. That is the implicit part, and I'll illustrate that in a moment. But there's something else that we need to keep track of. Yes, if it's like already been like, allocated or written? Yes, we need to know whether the block is allocated or free. So we know, can we out give it to someone else? And so our header is going to be eight bytes, uh, kind of one word of, of memory. And we're going to want it to keep track of both the size and whether the block is allocated or free. Now we could have sort of 16 bytes, eight for the size, eight for allocated or free. Why would that, that would be a little wasteful. Why, why would having kind of eight bytes for each of these not be the most efficient? Why? I mean, that's a whole lot of money to save. Them. Yeah, why, like, what about it is like un, unused or like not useful? Why? Would it be because um, like you would be doubling the size of each block? Yeah, we'd be adding extra space, but do we actually need eight bytes to keep a track of whether something is allocated or free? Like how how much memory would it actually take to yeah. yeah, just a single bit, a zero or a one, to say allocated or free. So it would be really wasteful to use an entire 64 bits when we only need one. What? So this is kind of like a memory question, I suppose. Like, so Malik splits into blocks, and inside those blocks could be like chunks, or like what's that? And then like, then when you split a block, each like segment of a block. Uh, so when I say chunk, I just mean a block. Yeah. Uh, blocks are sort of the technical term. Chunk, I just mean you know some amount of bytes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, chunk is not a kind of technical term uh, in this context. Uh, yeah, so one useful observation is that our uh, 
If our blocks are going to be 16 byte aligned, this is going to mean that that the sizes of our blocks are going to need to be multiples of 16. If these blocks are all next to each other and they each need to be 16 by a line, they're all going to, the size is going to be a multiple of 16. Um, and if I told you that this, if we're thinking in decimal numbers for a moment, and I told you the size is going to be a multiple of 10, what could you tell me about the digits is there, is there something that we could assume about the digits of the size? So I said this decimal number is going to be a multiple of 10. Yeah. Um, the first digit will always be 0. Exactly. That first digit, when we're talking about a multiple of 10, almost contains no information. Right? It doesn't, like the kind of all the information about the value of the number is kind of in the other digits. Um, and we're talking about multiples of 16, they have this same property. That the lowest four bits are always zeros in a multiple of 16. And so for this header, we're going to kind of have the size in uh, these higher 60 bits. And we know that the lower four are always going to be zero. And since they're always going to be zero, we can just use one to keep track of whether it is allocated or free. So we'll just say the least significant bit of the header will be one when the block is allocated and zero when the block is free. And so we'll be able to combine our allocated and free and our size kind of in the same eight bytes. Right, Sandy? No. Why is it 16 line? Uh, this is what Malik does on a 64-bit system. Uh, I think it's because there are, like, you can have uh, basically extra large integers that are 16 rather than 8 bytes. Uh, this is, this is like not uncommon in uh, programming on a 64-bit system, uh, so I believe that's why. Though I have not found sort of any official documentation that says that is the, that is the reason, but it is what, what systems tend to do. Other questions on this structure of this header? All right, so what is this? implicit part, and how do we actually know where the next uh, uh, the next block is? All right, so for this, I'm going to go back to our trusty spreadsheet. And let me break down what's going on in this picture. So the first thing that I want to point out is we need some way to know, for, for the allocator to know, where the start of the heap and the end of the heap are. And we want some kind of particular way of marking kind of there's a block that's always the start and there's a block that's always the end. So that we say no when we have reached the end of the heap and that we have some kind of predictable way in which the heap starts. So we know sort of where the beginning is. Uh, and these are referred to as the prologue and the epilogue blocks. When we're talking about an implicit free list. The prologue in this case is just a 16 byte block. And the epilogue is an eight byte block where its size is recorded as zero. And this way you know uh, when you get to a block that's of size zero, you have reached the end of the heap. So I've had a few kind of requests uh, uh, come into this heap. Malloc for eight, malloc for 40, malloc for eight. So when this malloc eight came in, 
We started the prologue, and the size of the block tells you, in fact, how many bytes away the start of the next block is. So when I, I'm at this prologue block, I say, okay, its size is 16, so I'd go 16 forward to the next block. The size of that block says 16, so it's 16 forward to the next block. And so Q was placed in this 16-byte block. We had 8 bytes for the size, with something indicating it's allocated, which I'm showing here just by color, but there'd be a 1 or a 0 in that least significant bit. And this pointer Q that Malik returned, it referred to these 8 bytes. Right? It referred to the payload, which was 8 bytes after the size. Why, why wouldn't we want to return Q to this address? Lucia? Exactly. It means the user you know, writes to the pointer we gave them, and they just overwrite the size, and now we have no idea how big this block is. Uh, R was allocated. Uh, was allocated here, S then allocated again in these bytes, then we freed R, and this block went back to being freed. When we have P equals malloc of 24, we start at our prolog, we, it's allocated, so we follow and if we go 16 bytes forward, for our kind of implicit next pointer, just using the size, add that to the address we're currently at. To get to this block, it's allocated, so we add 16 to that. We reach this free 48 block, and we split it, in this case, into a block of 1232, which will include 24 bytes, to actually meet this request for 24 bytes, uh, and then a kind of leftover 16 bytes uh, of a free block. Uh, and so this is our splitting our 48 block, 48 byte block into 32 and 16. And so imagine that we free P and we just say all we do is we you know mark this mark this uh, um, block as free and we're left with a, uh, a heap like this. This, is this a problem? Is there a reason why we wouldn't want to do this kind of simple thing of just take P and mark it as, as free? PJ? Exactly. We have, as I'm saying here, we have false fragmentation. We have this free chunk of 48 could be used to meet a request up to 40 bytes. So we have 40 bytes here plus a header, but our blocks are kind of split up so that if we actually kind of looked through the heap to, to meet a request of 40, we go, well, 32 isn't big enough, 16 isn't big enough, and we'd skip over this whole thing. Uh, and so we want to coalesce, we want to combine these two free blocks. And to do that, all we have to do is change the size of the header. That if we just say, okay, P is free, we look at the next block, it's also free, we see it's size 16, this is one of size 32, we add those two numbers together and say, okay, this block is a free block of size 48. According to our kind of implicit linked list, we have 16 goes to 16, goes to 48, goes to this 16. And so we didn't actually have to overwrite or change this 16 at all. We just leave it there in memory because the structure of our heap says this is all one block. And this is part of why when you get a chunk of memory back from malloc, it may have strange numbers in it because there may just be this leftover metadata is left over data for the heap's uh, own management that it just didn't bother to clear out of there because it doesn't need to. It doesn't have to care about what is in the bytes of a free block. All right, what are your questions on this? 
Does this make sense? All right, we'll talk more about uh, allocator implementation on Monday, but that will do it for today. Uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. Keep working on Lab 3, and I'll see you Monday.